Up next, we've got Jamie Levy, who I have known for about uh, almost 10 years now. Uh, she's one of the lead developers on the Volatility Project. And uh, she's got a pretty exciting talk about taking memory forensics to the next level. So take it away. Thank you. Um, so a little bit about myself before I start uh, talking. I have been involved with the Volatility Project. Uh, how many people actually have heard of Volatility, used Volatility? Oh, wow. So like almost everybody. This is great. Um, so I've been involved with the project for, yeah, almost 10 years now. And uh, I, I currently work as a trainer for the Volatility Project. Um, I also, in my day job, work as an investigative response uh, person. And uh, I'm also a previous uh, college professor for Queens College and John Jay College, where I've taught classes on uh, forensics and core computer science courses. <laughs> um, so a little bit uh, about volatility for some people that maybe don't know about it. Um, there is a lot of documentation. We do try to document things very well for the framework. Um, there's also a almost 900 page book that we put out uh, called The Art of Memory Forensics and it talks about memory forensics very extensively. Um, so it's definitely worthwhile to, to get that. Um, there's also the Malware Analyst Cookbook which was written by MHL who's also a core developer on the project. It has in that book about four chapters on memory forensics. We have a wiki on the Volatility uh, Project GitHub, where we have links to various papers, uh, blog posts, anything memory forensics related that we've been able to find online uh, so that you can actually read about what other people have done and other research about volatility. Um, so it's definitely worthwhile to look at that wiki. Um, there's a lot of cool information that you can find over there from over 60 authors. So the Volatility Project is open source. It's written in Python. It's uh, under the GNU version two license. Uh, and so uh, it's very useful for you to, uh, to be able to read the code, if, to be able to extend it uh, however you want. Uh, if you're not somebody who really wants to write your own code though, we do have 250 plugins. And those plugins are, ten, are more than 250 plugins actually. Um, and those plugins uh, can also be extended and inherited another code as well. And so you can, you can actually build things off of things that have already existed. And there are several different types of plugins that will uh, do these various features for you, like sample identification, process enumeration. Uh, we have kernel level plugins. We also have plugins that look at the registry. We have plugins that are malware specific, et cetera. Uh, out of the box, we have, frame, we have uh, support for all of the uh, modern operating systems, uh, all the modern Windows operating systems, all the modern Mac and Linux operating systems. However, the uh, architecture itself is built in a modular fashion, so you can actually build profiles for other systems that do not have support for them. So if you wanted to look at a Solaris machine or something else that we don't have a profile for, you could very easily do that. You can also build profiles for things that aren't necessarily memory. Um, so you can look at like network dumps or other types of dumps, as long as there's some kind of structure, underlying structure within that, uh, that uh, dump that you wanna look at, you're able to extend volatility to make sense of it. So normally volatility is used uh, in a one-on-one -on -one basis where you're looking at one machine and you're, uh, you're looking to see what's going on with that one machine. However, in the enterprise world, or if you have a business, for instance, you have many, many machines. And so you have to try to figure out how to make sense of the data without being able to just look at each machine on its own. Um, so that's where we start to extend volatility. And we start to do things like profiling, try to make a little more sense of lots of different machines uh, at once. So obviously the purpose is we wanna make sense of what's going on with many machines. We want us to be able to cut through the noise and we want to be able to find out what's happening, which machines are of interest, what's of interest on those machines, et cetera. And so we can use things from the disk forensics world, things like uh, baselining, whitelisting, blacklisting. We can do things like that. We can also look for indicators of interest. So indicators of compromise, things that we know a priori that we're actually looking for. <clears throat> so 
there's different methodologies that you can do. Um, the basic methodology is that you have some known good profile that you have from a, a machine that is a golden base image. In this profile, it will have various items, artifacts that are on the machine, like processes that were running, DLLs that were loaded, imports, exports, um, any uh, injected code, because there are injected code segments that are normal to an operating system. Um, all these other things of interest that we might want to know that are good, and that way we can use those to filter out the noise. Um, but the thing is, like, over time, you'll have different states of the operating system. So let's say that you have a baseline at one point in time. It doesn't necessarily mean that that baseline is going to be good forever, because operating system states change. Uh, we also have users that are interacting with the machine, and they're going to be using different applications. They're going to be using different software at different times. They're going to be all these different things that are going to happen. So the way that you can expand these profiles is you can look at them over time and add these new artifacts into these profiles. And so there are actually plugins that are written uh, in order to do this called Profiler and Stalker. And Profiler just gets this baseline for you. And Stalker will take some known baseline and it will find artifacts that are not in that baseline and then add things to the, the new baseline. You can also fill in gaps from the disk. Um, so there's going to be files, DLLs. There's going to be things on the disk that are not necessarily loaded at any point in time. And so you can also use other tools to fill those items in. And so um, what we've done in the past is we had inscripts, but you can also extend SleuthKit in order to get file listings and information from the disk in order to extend that. So how do you go about doing this? How do you, in a normal situation, if you're talking about from an enterprise point of view, um, we're not going and acquiring a piece of memory and then making a profile from it. We want to look at the machine as it's live. And so we're using a technique called sampling. And sampling is, uh, it actually uh, <clears throat> is, the way that you usually can go about this is you, Unfortunately, there's not like a really good open source uh, tool that driver that will allow you to look at a live machine. That's the downside. Um, but there are commercial tools that you could use like FResponse or even uh, InCase in order to do this. And the only open source tool that would allow you to look at a live machine right now are uh, WinPMM, uh, uh, for instance which is part of uh, GUR, which is written by Google. And, but the thing is, like, it really needs a lot of testing. Um, so that is one option that you could use if you're only wanting to look at it from an open source point of view. However, um, I'm going to be talking about it from F-Response because this is something that we have done in the past uh, where we worked at a data center, and there were lots of machines, and we needed to be able to sample them very quickly and make sure that things weren't going to crash. So the sampling method, you load a driver, you're looking at this machine over the net, and you're able to pull back the, the information that you want, just the very basic information. So like if you wanted just the PS list, the processes that are running, or if you just want only the DLLs or whatever, you get that information back over the network. And so that's very useful because that allows you to query across many machines over the enterprise instead of looking at each machine individually. So this is the idea that we're doing. So now we have to be able to create our baselines and to go about uh, doing this methodology. So the baselines have uh, the normal things that we would find on a clean operating system. Uh, in order to make sense of all these different artifacts, uh, there's a library that I wrote uh, that is a, basically a container class for all these different artifacts and things that they represent. And so here's um, a rough listing of things that are supported within this library. Um, all the basic things that you would want to look at if you're, if you're doing memory forensics. And there are some other things that are left off of this slide. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create these baselines. So obviously we want to look at processes. We want to look also at the relationships of these processes. 
What are the parent-child relationships, the heritage information? Because that can also tell you uh, something about what's normal on the machine. You also want to look at services, um, loaded DLLs, modules, all these other items that we've said. Now, where things get tricky is whenever you start looking at injected code and hooks and things like this, where, the, where they're going to be different between different run times on the machine. Um, because we're going to have memory addresses and things like that that are going to be different between the different runs. And so uh, this is where things get a little bit trickier. But we do have this built into the library to actually do the code in inspection and see whether or not we're looking at memory, uh, memory allocations or whatnot and be able to uh, wildcard those. And we're using YAR rules for that. Um, and then, of course, we can fill in all these different gaps with the disk, and we can use our stalker plugin that we talked about before. So here's an example where we're looking at uh, these different hooks. And of course, normally when people see something like this, they're like, oh my god, I'm infected. Well, obviously that might not be the case if you've been doing this for a while. There are legitimate reasons why you would have hooks, uh, various uh, security software, or even things that are just normal to Microsoft Windows. And so what you have to do is you have to actually look at the code of where these hooks start and see what is it actually doing. And is it something that I have known about? Um, so in this case, these happen to be uh, hooks that are created by semantic antivirus. So um, this makes work a lot easier to be able to do these code comparisons where you're not going down a rabbit hole every time you have a piece of injected code um, if it's something that's not necessarily malicious. Uh, so this is what it would look like uh, from a text output of, uh, from this library. And the way that the library will store this is it actually stores the raw data, and then when you want to uh, print this out or you want to create rules, it will do this, it will yarify it on the fly, um, or it will use a uh, die storm to give you this printout of what's actually there. So you can do manual comparisons uh, on your own. Since this is all just a container class library written in Python, you can interact with it within a Python shell as well. Um, so we can do uh, very easily the whitelisting and blacklisting. Um, and then we can also use indicators of compromise. So once you have these container classes, it's very easy to just go across. Like if you know that, for instance, that you have a piece of malware that has these certain um, indicators for it, then you can very easily use this, uh, this library in order to hunt for various other things on the, uh, on the network. So um, it, we also have a method for feeding in known indicators from things like Cybox and Sticks. And so we like those uh, particular uh, container artifacts because they're written in Python, and we can very easily manipulate them. So we, there's a Cybox or plugin which allows you to automate this. So you can take these uh, Cybox rules and you can very easily go across uh, the enterprise and look to see whether or not you have other machines that are infected, things that need to be quarantined or looked at further. And then you can uh, acquire the entire memory at that point. So the profiling can actually uh, pretty, be pretty uh, useful, not only for finding malware, but also for finding things like what um, software you have installed, what uh, different versions of software do you have installed, and all the differences between that. And also just finding like the indicators uh, for various things and doing diffs of, uh, of different memory. And you can also combine these profiles all into one. So it, for instance, if you have like several machines or these several run states, several good things, you can have many, many baselines. You can combine them into one baseline. You can also have a whole profile that contains um, all the indicators for all the interesting things that you'd be interested in. Or you can ver do it on a very granular level, where you have, like, for each different version of malware X or software X, we have a profile for it. So <clears throat> it took a little bit to figure out how we wanted to represent these profiles. And so the, the easiest way that I found was by doing uh, set theory. And so um, we have all this set 
theory stuff built into it uh, so that we can do all these different differences and unions and, and everything to accomplish all the different things that we wanted and figure out all the different relationships that we wanted uh, between machines and softwares and, and whatnot. Um, so here's an example uh, of, of uh, a set difference where we have, we have a golden image and we have a suspect profile. So we have our golden baseline and we have a machine that we, we want to know, we know something's bad with this machine, but we don't know what the indicators are. And so here in just five lines of code, and two of them are import statements, um, I'm able to figure out what are the artifacts for that particular suspect machine. So I'll create an object that uh, has this golden baseline, and then I have my suspect <laughs> object, and then I'm just taking the suspect and subtracting out the things that I've known. I'm also able to combine uh, several profiles into one profile doing union statements. I'm also able to do an intersection. So if I want to see the things that are common, like between malware families, for instance, I'm able to do that uh, as well. And this is all just the code that you would use for that. Um, if I wanted to find uh, elements that are in A or B, but not both of those machines, I can also do that with just a few lines of code. And so you can see how this could be very useful because you can have all these multiple profiles for different things, and they mean different things, and the different set option, operations that you do on them mean different things, and so you're able to figure out the, all these different relationships for them. But in order to make it even more usable, uh, this is also self-generating code. So you can get profiles that are actually Python code profiles, and you can feed those into uh, extra iterations of, of uh, runtimes in order to get, build like a larger picture over time. So for instance, if you wanted to look at a machine, you just want to keep looking at it and see what's, what are all these differences that are happening over time, you can actually very easily do that. And of course, you might want a text readable output or JSON or Cybox or Styx output so you can share these in different ways in addition to this profile. So um, here's an example where we're running the profiler plugin. And I'm, get, I'm building all these different profiles. So I have a profile for semantic antivirus when, after it's installed, after, while it's doing a scan, and while it's doing an update. And here's an example output in just a few lines of code where I can see all of the different artifacts that semantic antivirus has uh, contained within it. And I'm also able to combine all of these into one large profiler, profile, and if I wanted to, I could even write another plugin uh, with, for volatility that would look for that particular version of Semantic or look to see whether or not it's not installed. And these would be just two different operations, like if I want to find the artifacts that are in that profile or if I want to find the things that are not in that profile. Um, so, it's very easy to monitor uh, live machines using this uh, methodology. And it's also very easy to uh, create this Cybox profile uh, for you or sticks. Uh, it, it's basically the same type of operation. Here I have a, uh, a plugin where it's going to create a Cybox output file. So it's just importing uh, this profiler uh, plugin and it's subtracting out the known golden, uh, it's going to combine the known golden and the semantic uh, pro profiles together, and then it's going to uh, subtract out the, the known artifacts that are on this particular machine, subtract out all that baseline information, and output that to Cybox. So this is just the code for that. Um, so Stalker, the way it works is it's just adding new artifacts. Uh, when you hit Control C, it will just output whatever it's found up to that point. It also has all the same outputs as we talked before, text, JSON, Cybox, sticks, um, and a profile. And then the Hunter uh, plugin, which will look for uh, Cybox rules or sticks rules, also has all of these different outputs. So here's an example where um, we're looking at 
uh, these memory samples that were created for a particular forensics challenge. And that, those memory samples are infected with a uh, rat and there's some various activity that the uh, malicious user has done on these machines. And so this were Windows, I think it was a Windows 2003 server. Um, I had profiles for it, this server, um, for different ser versions of the server, clean profiles. And then if I just do like a subtraction of those baselines, then there's certain things that just pop out to me. So um, obviously it just cut away a bunch of crap that normally runs on the Windows 2003 server. And it would have cut away a bunch of other things too if I had a more complete baseline of, of a machine that was uh, with, with similar software installed. And then here again, uh, it cuts through uh, a lot of this information. I can see very easily what are the items that I want to focus on instead of having to go through hundreds of, of DLLs or thousands of DLLs or whatever. I'm able to find the items that are actually interesting. Um, so this was actually bit, built out of fury because a lot of times you would get these machines and you just want to know what is the thing that I should focus on. And when you have so many machines to look at at once, you just can't spend a whole lot of time looking at them all individually and then following you know, the code for every single little thing. Um, so hopefully that seems like it was uh, interesting for you. Uh, I'll do like a small demo since we're running out of time. So this is, um, this is after I have, I have these different um, baselines. I have a cl two clean baselines and a baseline after some malware was installed on the machine. And so you, here you can see the, the code where I'm creating uh, this overall uh, baseline, for combining these two baselines into one. And then I'm creating an object that contains the malware baseline. And then I'm going to just print out all the different artifacts for that piece of malware. So if I run that, I get all the different artifacts. I have all the different code segments and I have the hex dump, I have the disassembled uh, version as well. Um, but the disassembly is obviously not going to make much sense because it's just some strings that we have uh, within these different code segments. I have the different processes that that were created uh, for, from that particular piece of malware. I have the DLLs that are of interest. I have uh, mutexes that were created, etc. So it very quickly allows me to cut through a lot of that, uh, that nonsense that I wouldn't normally want to, to look at. This is what um, a profile looks like. We have all these different artifacts associated with it. But at the end, we have um, the class where it actually, where it actually um, creates the object that we're, that we're interested in. And you can, you can define all these different things uh, associated with it, like which machine it was taken from, um, whatever malware name, et cetera, like that. So that way you can, you can keep track of all that as well. And since it's all Python, you can interact with, it, with all these different objects as well. So if you have all these different process objects, you could um, print them out different ways that you want. You could print out the whole text version. Um, there's a function for that. Or you could just print out like just their name or command line or whatever you want uh, at that point. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I typed a little too rough here. There you go, um, et cetera. So you can interact with these as, as, as granularly as you want. And this isn't, um, 
released yet, but it will be released on GitHub uh, by the end of the week. So I just got a few bugs I got to get out of it, and, uh, <laughs> and then you'll be able to play around with it as, as much as you want. So are there any uh, questions about? Yes, there's one in the back. I'm sorry? Oh, mobile? You mean like for, like if you want to look at like uh, Android phones and stuff like that? Is that what you're asking for? Yes. Um, yeah, so yeah, you could very easily th do that as well. I mean, anything that, that volatility uh, supports, then the profiling code should support as well. And we do have support for Android. Okay, other questions? Okay. Do you think the lack of this diffing ability has been the main barrier for someone making like a OS query esque tool for like that does memory forensics and volatility profiles and things of that nature? Do you think this is this has been the main barrier to creating that? Um, I don't. I'm not exactly sure if it's been like a barrier. I know that that some people have done some various diffing stuff or they've tried to, but they haven't really looked at like. Uh, for the injected code segments and code in general, like that's been hard for people to to figure out how to deal with. Um, so maybe that was like their main barrier, but like diffing processes and stuff like that, that wasn't as hard for people to, to do. Okay, thanks. Um, another question, do you, are there concerns with like um, Lime with anti-forensics? Like, I don't know much about forensics, but can you mess up the actual memory dump before you yeah, so there have been um, there have been projects that, or at least there was even an open source one um, called uh, Dementia, and uh, and what it would do was if it saw that there was a memory acquisition tool that was on the machine, it would protect certain memory segments that uh, were of interest, like the piece of malware, the the process, and everything that that were interesting for that particular piece of malware, it would make sure that as it was written to, um, to disk, that those items were left out of it. But that's whenever you cross over from kernel into user mode. If everything had stayed in kernel mode, it would have, it would have thwarted that me method, unless, it, unless you actually have access to kernel mode. But in this case, this is what they were doing. And, um, and then also, uh, there were other ways around it, like if you were, if the, the acquisition tool were to encrypt the data that it was dumping out, or if it were to use some other scheme like uh, EWF, which is a compression method, um, then yeah, then they, they would still get the information regardless of that. But yeah, there are, there are any forensics uh, met, uh, methodologies, and, and definitely there's something that you have to consider. Thanks. Okay, so maybe I'll get the last question. Yeah, so the uh, mobile, uh, so the overlay function, you know, there's a lot of uh, malware out there that looks overlay uh, to harvest credentials. I'm sorry, the, the overlay function you're saying? There's a lot of overlay malicious applications. Uh-huh that harvest credentials. Uh -huh. Do you, do you uh, provide uh, defensive defense against those or no? Uh, no, it's not actually a defensive tool. This is an aftermath. Aftermath? Yeah. OK, thanks. OK, uh, let's thank the speaker. Thank you very much.